real pleasure to be here today uh, to talk to you at UX Brighton. So I'm Alice Helliwell, um, as Danny said, um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about this question, what is creativity? Um, so before we kind of get started on this, I am going to uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a philosopher. Um, so my, my sort of, I spend all my time basically thinking. Um, my background is in philosophy and psychology, so I've been in this space for a while. Um, and uh, what I spend my time thinking about really, as any philosopher does, is concepts. Um, so it's actually quite hard to sort of find an image to represent concepts, so I sort of picked this one from, from stock image website. Um, but this is what I spend my time thinking about, and one of the concepts I think about is creativity. Um, and there's a reason for that, it's because most of my research is focused on looking at art um, and looking at artificial intelligence. And you might have seen this in the news recently, a lot of images like this. This is an image made by Stable Diffusion, which is an AI system. Um, and this is what my research is really focused on. So I spend my time thinking about questions such as, can AI be creative? Can AI make art? Is the works that AI make, are they, have they got any value? Are they any good? Um, and are there any sort of ethical concerns with generative AI? Um, so really very current. Um, I'm lucky that there's lots of conversations going on about this now. Um, but in order to think about something like whether AI can be creative, we need to know what creativity is. Um, so that's something that I've spent quite a lot of time sort of digging into, um, looking at various sort of approaches to this question. Um, and that brings us back to our sort of central question uh, for today, which is, uh, what is creativity? And I'm going to try and answer this um, for us today, or at least give us a few different options of how we could approach uh, this question. Um, so it's actually quite hard to define creativity. I mean, it's a term we use an awful lot. Um, it's something we talk about. We talk about wanting creativity. We want creative people. We want creative um, sort of uh, solutions to problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what exactly do we mean? Um, and if you try and sort of pin down a definition, it can be quite hard. Um, and this is not uh, sort of just a general public problem. Uh, it's also a problem for researchers. So here's a little quote from Margaret Bowden, who is a very well-known creativity researcher. And she says, human creativity is something of a mystery, right? Um, but she does, she does say a bit more than that, which I'm going to go through, uh, luckily. Um, otherwise, we, we could just sort of leave it there. Um, so today, I'm going to talk through uh, three different approaches uh, to defining creativity. Um, now, when we think about creativity, we often talk about thinking of three different things. We think about creative products, um, so kind of making things that are creative, creative outputs, maybe creative ideas. We think about creative people, so whether a person is creative, often whether they're making those kinds of creative products or whether they're doing that in a way that seems creative. Um, and that brings us to process, so creative processes. How do we go about producing creative things? Um, so in my talk today, I'm going to go through these sort of one by one, um, how we might approach each one of these, um, product, person, and process. And then I'm going to try and offer a little bit of sort of implications of um, what I've said um, for how you might take this to an organization or a team. Um, so I'm mainly going to focus really on product and process because these are the ones that I look at most in my research, but I'll say a few words on creative people as well. Okay, so let's turn to product first. Um, now, uh, so cr creative products um, often are defined in a way very similar to this. So this is a, a quote from Margaret Bowden again. Um, so creativity, she says, is the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising, and valuable. Um, and this idea of particularly novelty and value is very common in discussing creativity. Um, so note here that we're not just talking necessarily about physical things. So I've said product, but I don't just mean sort of commercial products. I'm also meaning ideas, um, such as we could think about um, just a sort of creative solution, a scientific theory. Um, we could think about a musical composition uh, or some kind of concept. Um, and we could also think about uh, physical things as well, right? Artifacts, so, you know, paintings, sculptures, um, origami, who knows, right? Anything you can imagine. Um, so here from this kind of definition, we can distill three things, right? We've got novelty, we've got value, and we've got surprise, um, at least for Bowdoin. So she wants any creative product to have these three things. They need to be novel or original, valuable and surprising. Um, so this is the definition of creativity, right? There we go, I'm done. Um, that's at least one approach, right? 
But we could dig down a little bit more, and indeed, uh, Margaret Bowden does. She goes into a little bit more detail about exactly what she means by these three things. Um, so let's turn to novelty. What do we mean when we talk about novelty? Um, so uh, Bowden, she talks about two different kinds of uh, creativity based on different kinds of novelty. So the first one we can imagine um, a child, say. So imagine a child is doing a drawing, a drawing like this. Um, here they've got, you know, a, a house, a, a square uh, with a little triangle roof on top. Um, they've got the sun there, or we, we think it's the sun, right? We've got a circle with lines coming off. Um, it's a very typical kind of child-like drawing um, of a, a scene. Um, but for a child, this, this could be very new, right? So they may have just graduated from scribbles on a page um, to producing an image like this. So for that child, this might be the first time they've made an image like this. Um, and that's novelty, right? And indeed, we might want to say that that's creative. For that child, they've been creative. But as onlookers, we would see this and we'd think it was quite unoriginal. Like, no offense to the child, you know, we've all been there um, creating images like this, um, but it's not really that original. When we talk about creativity, we're often appealing to something a little bit more than this. We're often thinking about something more like creative genius, um, sort of something revolutionizing a field. Um, think of many kind of people through history that you think are creative geniuses. That's often what we're trying to get at when we're talking about creativity. Um, and so, for example, we might think of someone like August Kukula, who was a chemist. Um, and his focus was on this problem of define, deciding what sort of determining what the structure of benzene was. And the story goes that he was dozing by the fire one night, and in a dream, he, he uh, sort of dreamt of this, this Ouroboros, right, the snake eating its tail. And then he awoke, and suddenly the idea came to him. Benzene was in a ring structure. There we go. Um, and he was right about that. So he was right that uh, benzene is in a ring structure. His exact drawing was not quite right, but, but pretty much he was on the money. Now, no one had thought of that before. It was a completely new idea. Um, and this is often what we're thinking about when we're thinking about creativity, these kind of entirely new ideas. And Bowden distinguishes between these two. So she thinks that both are creative, um, but they're different kinds of creativity. So she calls them P creativity and H creativity for psychological creativity and historical creativity. So psychological creativity is just creativity for you as a person, right? The first time you've come up with this idea, the first time you've done this thing or drawn this picture. Um, but H creativity is uh, creativity in the whole of human history the first time this has been done, right? So the first time anyone came up with this structure was uh, Kukula sleeping by the fire. Um, so we can distinguish here these different types of novelty and therefore different types of creativity. But novelty might not be enough um, to determine whether something's creative. Just because something is novel, it doesn't mean that it's creative. For example, here's a sentence by Noam Chomsky, um, composed by Noam Chomsky, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Um, so Chomsky composed this as an example of a sentence that's grammatical, but nonsense. It has kind of no semantic meaning, has no real sort of value communicatively. Um, and we can think of examples like this, of these sort of original sentences that, that really have, uh, they're a bit sort of rubbish, they're kind of garbage, right? Um, and we talk about original garbage in, create, in this sort of uh, discussion as not being creative. So many people think that this kind of thing is not creative, it's just original, it's just novel. And so we need to add something else in order to determine whether something is truly creative. Um, and for Bowdoin and, and many others, um, that addition is value. So we want our thing not just to be original garbage, we want it to have some value as well. Now this could be any kind of value, many different kinds of value. Um, so it could be something like monetary value, financial value, something that's sort of precious in some way. Um, or it could be something that's useful, that's kind of useful for us um, in many different domains. We could think of something that was artistically valuable um, or beautiful, um, aesthetically pleasing, all of those kinds of, of words. Um, that could be the kind of value we're talking about. Or we could think of something that was kind of solving a problem um, and it was valuable in that sense. Now, any of these are fine for talking about creativity. It kind of doesn't matter necessarily which of these sorts of value um, that something has um, in order to be creative, our creative product, um, they all kind of count. So we've got novelty and value. 
And for Bowdoin, um, she adds another uh, condition to creativity, which is this one of surprise. So she wants products to be surprising. And again, she breaks this down a little bit further. Um, so she talks about um, sort of three kinds of uh, surprise and unexpectedness in a creative product, corresponding to three different types of creativity again. So the first one she talks about is what she calls combinational creativity. The second is exploratory creativity and the third is transformational creativity. So I'm gonna go through these one at a time. Um, the first is combinational creativity. Um, and this is about combining uh, different ideas together to make something new. So they're familiar ideas or familiar things, but we're recombining them and using that to pro produce something that's new um, and of course valuable. Now, Bowdoin offers examples such as analogies, um, imagery in poems, um, and collage. So here we've got an example of a collage. We've brought together different images um, to make a new one. And artists can do this, um, and they're still making something new. Um, but Bowdoin thinks this is just combining, so just combinational creativity. Another kind of creativity she puts forward is what she calls exploratory creativity. And this is about generating novel ideas by the exploration of structured conceptual spaces. So the idea is that we've got this kind of conceptual space out there and we're exploring sort of the limits of that space. Um, now in this case, we have um, ideas that are both novel and unexpected, but fit within maybe some existing norms um, for the relevant thinking style. So they're not cut sort of entirely out there, um, but they're a little bit more than just recombining. Um, so an example might be an artist who's kind of trying a new technique. Um, so I've got the example here, this is David Hockney's work. Um, and David Hockney's been experimenting quite a lot with digital art, with drawing on iPads. Um, and then he kind of can play for us his creative process of producing these images. This was an a, um, immersive experience that I went to from Hockney. Um, so Hockney um, has taken an existing thing, which is kind of digital art and his own style, and he's brought those together, bringing something new to this um, sort of style of making art um, with his own work. So here, this technique already existed, but it hadn't been used by this artist. Um, and so they're sort of exploring it, and that's exploratory creativity. And the final type of sort of uh, surprise or unexpectedness for Bowdoin um, is the idea of impossible ideas made possible. Uh, she calls this transformational creativity. So again, we're talking about a conceptual space, but instead of exploring within that conceptual space, that space has been transformed. Um, and this opens up kind of new um, areas of that conceptual space um, so that things that were previously not possible could now arise. So an example might be something like Duchamp the, or the Dada artists of the 20th century. Here we've got the fountain. Now before this work, um, this idea of bringing ready-made objects into the art world would have been uh, thought of as sort of impossible, right? Um, but after doing this, it kind of changed our view of what art is and often we discuss this in the philosophy of art, um, this movement changed our idea of what art is and made all sorts of new kinds of artwork possible. We might call this transformationally creative. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of product-focused approach, or at least one of the product-focused approaches. So what about people then? What about creative people? Well, often creative people are defined in terms of the products they make. Um, so this kind of it adds a little bit maybe, um, but not that much. So here a person with the ability or disposition to produce things that are novel, valuable and surprising. So creative people are people that make creative products. But this doesn't really tell us that much about those people um, and what they do. Um, so perhaps we can find a little bit more out about them. Um, one question we might have is whether creativity is fixed or whether we can get better at it. So think back to Bowdoin's account uh, of creativity, that sort of P creativity, that child doing the drawing. So everyone is creative to maybe some extent, um, but can we get better at it? Can I become sort of like Kakula doing this huge sort of uh, historical first? Um, so there's sort of two main camps here. Some people argue that no, you basically can't. You're, Creativity is a natural ability, so you either have it from birth or maybe it's sort of a trait like personality or something like that. Um, but you kind of are or aren't creative to, to that sort of great extent. But other people argue that, that creativity is like a kind of skill that you could practice. Um, for example, Barry Scott argues that creativity is a skill. Um, and others have talked about different factors um, of sort of practice that can make you more creative. Um, Margaret Bowden, to revisit again, is one of those people. So she talks about um, 
What makes the difference between an outstanding creative person and a less creative one is not only special power, but greater knowledge in the form of practiced expertise and the motivation to use and acquire it. Um, and this motivation, she thinks, endures for long periods, perhaps uh, shaping and inspiring a whole lifetime. So we can highlight two things here. We've got that idea of motivation. So it's not, it's not clear whether that's something you can kind of grow or, or learn, um, but knowledge seems like something we can learn. So practiced expertise, we can certainly practice things, we can certainly gain more expertise. So potentially we can, um, at least under some of these accounts, um, sort of grow our creative abilities. Um, so some views focus not on people or the products that they create, um, but on creative processes. So let's turn to this. So one view initially by someone called Campbell um, in the 1960s and then revisited by a researcher called Dean Simonton um, more recently is that creativity is similar to evolution. Um, so they propose that creativity kind of follows the, the selectionist model of evolution put forward by Darwin. Now we can kind of see why people might think this, right? It's not really that surprising. So we can see evolution is somewhat creative. We have these valuable things, these beautiful things in nature um, that are kind of, uh, it's sort of, there's products out there, there's sort of natural things, such as fruit, we've got flowers, um, beautiful butterflies, right? Um, the canopies above trees, which a lot of people talk about, how they don't touch and make these intricate patterns. Um, so it's not unthinkable that we could use this as a sort of model of creativity. Um, so Darwin in the 19th century proposed uh, the theory of natural selection, and this is the model that then gets applied um, to creativity. So just to explain a little bit about that, um, so you can't quite see the lines there, but they sort of go down. Um, so uh, in a sort of population of say animals or people, um, there's mutations, right? Mutations, genetic mutations, genetic variations. Um, and this creates variation in that population of different traits. Um, so unfavorable mutations are selected against. This is the idea of natural selection, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, and reproduction occurs in the sort of more successful traits and are kind of passed on. Um, and then favorable mutations are more likely to survive again, and this kind of goes on and on and on. To give a more concrete example, we could think of the typical example that's used, which is giraffes. Um, so we've got giraffes with short necks and giraffes with long necks. Now, giraffes need to eat leaves on trees to be able to survive. So the giraffes with uh, long necks can reach more of those leaves, and the giraffes with short necks um, can reach fewer of them, and so are more likely to basically die out quicker, right? They're scarce the source of food. And the giraffes that long, with long necks survive uh, to reproduce, to meet other giraffes, um, and they pass on these genes um, to uh, you know, future giraffe populations. Um, so we can distill this down into a few different, um, so three different steps. Basically, variation occurs uh, through mutation and recombination of genes. Then we select um, against uh, the environment in this case. We make some sort of selection, those that survive and those that don't. And then these are retained and passed on through reproduction to the next generation. So how does this apply to creativity then? Um, it seems very focused here it's still on um, evolution, actual evolution. Um, so when it's distilled uh, and applied to different things, it's also applied to things like knowledge acquisition. Um, researchers suggest that we need blind variation, selection, and retention. These are like the key factors um, for, of this process. If we're thinking about creativity then, we can think about making a lot of different ideas, a lot of different things, um, sort of producing variation of our ideas. We can then think about sort of testing these in some way, having some selection criteria or a criteria of success um, for what would make a good idea. And then we retain these good ideas um, and sort of, you know, keep on going with them, maybe build on them. And we can kind of keep this going as a process um, where, we, where we sort of generate ideas, select them, and then sort of retain them. So this is how we might apply this kind of approach to creativity. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of blind variation, because um, this is quite key. So for Campbell, um, a truly creative idea cannot be anticipated. So we can't know in advance um, what that creative idea is going to be, otherwise we wouldn't have been creative. 
This is a common theme in a lot of creativity literature. So for example, Beres Gort says um, that creativity has the ignorance principle. A creative person cannot have an exact plan of what she will do prior to being creative. Um, so if creative ideas can't be anticipated um, and we can't know them in advance, and then we could ask, um, can we do anything to help this process, right? It seems like, well, it just sort of happens at some point. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know what's going to be before it happens. So could we do anything to, to sort of help this along? Well, some research suggests that we can. Um, so a researcher called um, Alan... Nuringer um, says that we can enforce variation, and he's done some experiments um, to show this. Basically, um, we can provide feedback to encourage people to vary what their ideas are, um, rather than just repeating or replicating the same ideas again and again. So if you give some positive reinforcement uh, for varying your ideas, um, then you're more likely to produce more variation, and then you're going to widen that pool of ideas um, that you've got to select from. Now, all these ideas don't necessarily have to be valuable, right? So we, this, is, this process is to find something that's creative. Um, so we could just generate lots and lots of variations, lots and lots of different ideas. Um, and that can then still help us to get to those ultimately valuable creative ideas in an endpoint. So I've gone through these three different approaches to creativity. I've talked about products, creative products. I've talked about creative people. And I've talked at the end there about creative processes. I'm going to try and say a little bit about what this might mean for innovation or what it might mean, what you could take forward from this um, when thinking about creativity, say, in your organization or team. So I'm going to propose a few different questions that you could be asking. So in thinking about making creative products, you could ask, is this product new? Is it valuable? And is it surprising? Right? So taking those three things from Bowdoin, and we could kind of apply that to what we're doing. If you're thinking about creative people, you could think, you know, do these people have the right kind of knowledge? Are they growing that knowledge? Do they have the right disposition? And do they have the right kind of motivation? Are they motivated to create new things? And then if we're going to focus on process, we could think about, um, is there lots of variation? Are there lots of different ideas? Um, are we sort of uh, reinforcing variation? Are we encouraging this production of, of more ideas within a team? And finally, we could ask, how are we selecting for good ideas? What's our selection criteria? What's our, our sort of process for um, deciding what's a good idea and what's not? So these are a few ways you might sort of take forward some of these uh, definitions or approaches to creativity into asking um, these kinds of questions in your team or organization. OK, so I've tried to give an answer to this question of what is creativity by looking at creative products, creative processes, creative people. And I've tried to give, at the end there, a little bit of how we might apply this, what the implications of this might be. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today.